And welcome to Creative Magic Club. Together, we'll discover inspirational stories of creative entrepreneurs living out their dreams, doing the work they are most passionate about, and building wealth in magical and fun ways. While building a six-figure income as a writer and coach, helping other women to launch their dream businesses, I've connected with so many incredible people and seen it proven again and again that you can thrive financially doing whatever it is you are passionate about. I am here to share life-changing strategies for mindset, making money, and reaching more people with your work in a business and life filled with creativity, freedom, and fun. Hi everyone, welcome. I'm so excited to introduce my guest who is actually, I think you're the first guest who's come on twice. So that's a very special honor to have you back on the show. Um, we have with us Samantha Bove. She is a Forbes featured leadership coach who empowers CEOs, leaders, and teams globally to harness the power of their intuition, to enhance decision-making, deepen communication skills, and cultivate unshakable confidence. She's the founder of Zen Boss Academy, an award-winning business school where she passionately teaches mission-driven entrepreneurs how to launch purpose-driven, profitable businesses. And Samantha is also a Reiki master with a specialty in body and emotional intelligence, mindful self-compassion, and meditation. She is also the host of the She's Too Much podcast. Hi, Sam. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, I'm so excited. So Sam is one of my cherished internet friends who I actually had the privilege of meeting up with in real life in New York a couple of weeks ago. And we were sat in Elizabeth Street Garden, this beautiful little oasis in the middle of Soho. And she was telling me all about her podcast. And we kind of like went down the rabbit hole in these really insp inspiring conversations. And I was like, we need to bring this to the podcast. So. I'm really excited to dive in. So you've recently launched the She's Too Much podcast. I love the title. I love the concept. So tell us about it. Like, why did you, what was the inspiration behind starting this podcast? Mm, yeah. So I don't even think when we, when we met up, I had launched the podcast yet. No. I think I was still, yeah, I think I was still in the writing phases and uh, it's so wild. You know this, I feel like better than anybody, like when it's in your head and that it actually like makes its way out in the different stages. And honestly, almost like a mini grieving process that mm -hmm. happens when it actually gets put out into the world and becomes its own thing. And so that's kind of where I'm at right now. We're like a month from launching and it's honestly, it's just been amazing. So the purpose of it really for me was, I needed to channel like some of my rage. I needed to channel some of my, I needed a place to channel my emotions and like all my feelings about what I've been witnessing in my own life as a woman who is just a lot. Like I fully accept and embrace and I'm on a journey of even accepting it even more that like I have pretty strong opinions. I'm definitely not quiet. I'm definitely not a wallflower. Um, I like talk really loud with my hands. I get really excited about things and I just, I feel a lot. And I, the real, I would say spark of it was my fiance and I separated uh, about a year ago, coming up on a year and a couple of weeks. And really at that point, I just felt like, oh, wow, I really do need too much from this person. Like, but it's not that I'm too much. I just need too much for what he can give me. And I actually require the perfect amount from someone who has the capacity or maybe the willingness or however you want to you know, look at it through the lens. Um, yeah, like there is somebody out there and there's a community of people, also my friends and my peers and my colleagues like you who look at me and are like, you're not too much of anything. You're the perfect amount for the right people. Your dreams aren't too much. Your needs aren't too much. You know, you don't overthink things. You think, you know, the perfect amount of that requires for whatever it is that you want to create 
And I really just wanted a space to explore all of these areas in my life from my sensuality, just being too much as I've embraced it more, my confidence, um, my dreams, my goals. I needed a place to talk about um, my own journey of how I'm like really trying to fully accept like this is who I am. And if I ever find myself in a space or with people that make me feel like I need to shrink, I'm getting out of there. It's not my place. Yeah. And I think, I think this is kind of a like challenging conversation. Like something I always think about is I'll never know what it feels like to be inside somebody else's body and no one will ever know what it likes to, to be, what it feels like to be me and to feel the way that I feel. Obviously, like we're all so complex. We have complex histories. We're all so different. And I feel like as a culture, our emotional intelligence is kind of like at the level of a toddler when it comes to identifying, expressing and talking about our emotions and like supporting each other in our emotions. I feel like we're definitely having an awakening around that. And, you know, obviously somebody, people like you and I, and just having these conversations is, you know, a part of that change. So I'm just curious because I've had this conversation with so many women about, yeah, obviously when you're in an environment where you're feeling judged or you're feeling like there's something wrong with you or you're feeling uncomfortable, but like the bad kind of uncomfortable, like, yeah, obviously that's not the right fit and we just get to move on and we get to, you know, get clear on what it is that we do need and what our needs are and what our desires are and know that there that is available for us when we're willing to put ourselves out there and find that. Um, but I just, would just love to hear a little bit more about like your process of, um, of identifying that because I know it's super complex also in personal relationships too. You know, I've also been through like a big challenging period of that supporting my partner while he's in med school and just like immigrating together and kind of, um, you know, going through recognizing patterns of codependency where like when some, when a relationship is really good, like, and it's really there for you and it's really meeting a lot of your needs and then suddenly it's not there and exposing where like, you know, our, our needs aren't being met in other places. And I think where I'm going with this ramble is what you're saying is it's okay for me to identify that I have a lot of needs and like that gets to be met. And obviously that's not all going to be met in one relationship. So yeah, I'm just curious sort of like how that conversation has evolved for you and understanding where, how to meet your own needs, what your needs are and like, yeah, taking responsibility for meeting them and making sure that others are, you know, a good match for, for meeting them and, and who you choose to be in relationship with. Mm, this is so good. Okay. So I obviously chose to separate from my then partner and that's obviously not the path for everyone, but I think that the defining thing that I've discovered for me when it comes to needs is that I actually don't need all of my needs met. I need all of my needs to be seen and to be respected. The beautiful thing I think about identifying needs is that sometimes once you're in this space where somebody, not only you've recognized the need, you voice the need and somebody says, I see that need. And either this is my insecurity that's making it very hard for me to meet this need, which is a huge level of emotional intelligence to be able to say your need is bumping up against my insecurity. And I don't know if I could handle that. Ideally, when you stay in a relationship, which is, you know, why I was in the relationship for as long as I was there, it's the person's willingness to say, I'm going to try. Mm -hmm. And it's that belief. And it's that faith that you believe that they could actually try to meet that need, right? And you're also doing whatever you can within yourself, of course, to fulfill that own need of whatever that is safety, love, acceptance, appreciation. But for me, I'm not only looking for somebody to like accept that I have these big goals or accept that I'm a certain way. Like I want like radical support. Like I really am looking for that like level of encouragement to bring me even beyond the barriers that I set on myself of my own limitations and my own security. So I recognize that I am asking for a lot, let's say on the romantic partnership front. But what I've really noticed about needs is that sometimes like the second they get met, you realize I actually don't need that. I thought I did, 
But actually that was coming from a place of wounding or from my own insecurity, thinking that you needed to meet that need when really I needed to. But once you really said to me like, okay, that's valid, because I think everybody's needs are valid, right? As long as they're not hurting anybody in the process, then it's like, okay, wow, all of a sudden the charge around, I need this and I need to be supported in this all of a sudden disappears. And so I think that's really the difference is like, you know, is somebody willing to, without judgment, see that need, which again, could often be like an insecurity and say like, I fully accept that. Like, I don't know if I can fully meet it, but I'm going to try, or at least I'm going to sit down with you and get curious about why it is that you need that and what it is that you're looking for. And I think if you don't have that, then to me, that's not the foundation of a partnership that I want at all. Yeah. I love that distinction. And I think what this is making me think of this whole concept of she's too much is ambition and this is the word that i've kind of um struggled with myself like i never really resonated with being ambitious and then it was something that kind of came up when i was working on my business and my messaging and the types of clients that i was looking to attract and i don't know there was a lot of a lot of words that kind of turned me off and i think because of the association that i had made with them around it being either like masculine or just you know not something that i identified with or something that i could see myself in until I really sat with it and I was like, oh no, like I'm really fucking ambitious. Like there's not many people that have as many big goals as I do. There's not that many people who, I mean, there are many because I'm constantly surrounded by people in that way. But I think the, re the realization for me was like, oh, there are people who don't want this and that's okay. And that's the distinction. And, um, and I think something that comes along with ambition which maybe has been easier to identify with for me is like passion and romance. And I think sometimes a lot of those things come hand in hand, right? Particularly with creatives and being like, recognizing myself as a romantic isn't something that I really connected with until I met my partner, who's also like super romantic. And when I suddenly was getting that, I was like, oh my God, I feel like I was always, I always wanted this, but I never had it. And that's the thing with with romantic relationships is, you know, I feel like we always just like settle for the best that we think we can get because we've never experienced, you know, the extent of what it could be. And then every relationship, you you kind of learn what you like and you don't like and you shift and you kind of shift your standards and know how to watch out for those things. And so, yeah, I think that's a beautiful thing. And I think, you know, probably most entrepreneurs like are really ambitious. And that is something to celebrate because we have the drive and we have the tenacity and like the work ethic to actually bring a lot of these things to fruition and we need that and so recognizing that we just you know we get to have the relationships that support us to make it easier and to feel really supported and it's okay to walk away from the ones where we feel like we're kind of battling even though it's not the easiest thing right yeah totally. I would love to I know that's been a big you're kind of like in this period of you know you had to walk away from that relationship which I can't can imagine must have been so challenging for you but I know that has opened you up to so many more amazing relationships so I'd love for you to like share that experience as a you know inspiration for anyone who may be in fear of walking away from from challenging relationships totally so I think this actually goes hand in hand <sighs> ambitious is all like um it's perceived right so like somebody could look at us and be like, well, that's, and it's also like the way that it's approached, like, oh, that's really ambitious of you to want to do that. But for us, like you publishing a book, us having podcasts, um, you know, being featured in certain places, speaking on stages, whatever those big things are, having homes wherever, traveling, like, to some people from their lens that could be ambitious, but it all really depends. Like you said about like, I'm more interested in the passion piece of it is like, what are you really passionate about? Because if somebody is like, ambition is to have a garden and like, you know, a, a home in the woods, like that's just, they're passionate about that. Like to me, that would be like such an ambitious goal because I'd have to like learn so much. I'd have to like be away from people who like bring me so much energy and like the city that I love. So I do think that's a really interesting thing to think about. And actually I find that 
it's the people that normalize my ambition that I feel the most comfortable with. So like why I enjoy spending so much time with you and we can chat for hours is that there's never this sense of if I'm saying I want to do something that you're like, oh, that's like overly ambitious. (laughs) That's amazing. That's so doable. And I think that that's a really good gauge for me with also like romantic partnerships and feeling like I was actually reflecting on this the other day. Like I felt like my dreams were so much more unattainable when I was in a partnership combination of like, he wasn't in this industry, didn't really understand how possible it is to have like the, the depths of connection and the level of success that I know we're both craving, but also I think it's a really good marker to notice the people in your life that really normalize your ambition and like see you in your passion and celebrate it. And those are all also often people who have their own passions and like have their own ambitions for life um so it's definitely something to think about but yeah in terms of leaving the partnership I mean yeah grant absolutely the hardest thing I've ever done um but also the easiest in a way um as soon as it happened I felt like I had a thousand pounds off of me um and yeah something that you said before about um I don't know if you were saying like women, but it's something I've been thinking about a lot, talking to my therapist a lot about is, um, you know, finding somebody that you really like, and then just kind of like latching, like, okay, like you could potentially meet some of my needs. So amazing. I'm going to just lock it down. And I have found that I'm pretty, um, rare in my experience of like wanting to date multiple people and like even saying it this is just all such patriarchal bullshit like even saying it I feel like I'm saying like the most like naughty radical thing in the world like I can feel it in my body saying like yeah like I've dated multiple men at the same time like going on dates talking to different people and I was talking to my therapist about it recently because um, I had posted that, um, I can't believe I'm sharing this, whatever, Um, the point, right? Um, I had posted that a girlfriend of mine, we've been like challenging each other to just build our confidence because as most people know, after a breakup, like my confidence was shit (laughs) and like my ex wasn't very like expressive with words of affirmation. And so, um, you know, I probably was told I was like beautiful, maybe like a handful of times in five years, which maybe not everybody needs that, but like, I really appreciate it. Um, and beauty from the recognition of like your, your radiant, like your energy, like God, nothing is better than a, like your energy is amazing compliment, not just physical beauty. But anyway, so my friend Dasha and I, we were really working on building each other's confidence. So we were challenging each other to like, give, if we saw an attractive guy, just like go give our number out without attachment. And so I did that a couple of times. And again, I was dating, you know, a couple of people at the time, nothing serious was very transparent. Like I'm dating right now. I need to be single for at least a year, just got out of this long relationship. And I had posted about it and we, this man and I weren't following each other on Instagram, but somehow I guess he saw it and, um, was like, it gave me the ick that you did that and I'm out. And so it was really interesting and so confronting for me because I'm like, wow, I told him I needed to be single. We had seen each other on dating apps. So we both knew we were dating. And yet my forwardness of giving a guy my number was so confronting that after however many months of us dating, you don't want to engage anymore. And it's been a really, really interesting experience and also really beautiful for me because it's going to take a lot for me to fully commit myself to someone after the experiences that I've had. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Like, I think that if I had taken a slower pace with my ex and with all of my relationships, I probably wouldn't have committed to moving in, to getting engaged, to all of these things if I had gotten to know the person for longer. Granted, everybody's timeline is different and everybody's connection is different. People get married after a month and some people just know right away. And I totally think all of those experiences are valid and true. But for me, I'm like, what is wrong with me really wanting to take my time? But what that's doing is it's bumping up against people's insecurities so big. And then all of a sudden it's redirecting 
directed towards the woman of like, you're gross. Like that's disgusting to want to do that. So it's definitely something I'm navigating, but in it, it's, it really has been a very illuminating experience of truly what it is that I'm like looking for and want. Hi loves, I wanted to let you know that I made a special free gift just for you. It's called the Cash Injection Ritual and it's my three-step method that you can use to create extra cash sales starting today. I used to suck at making consistent money and I believed I would never be good at sales because I refused to do anything that feels out of integrity. Then I discovered the powerful mindset shifts I'm about to share with you and I implemented this cash injection ritual to double my income three years in a row, making it to six figures in my dream coaching business. Now I'm so effing excited to share this work with you so you can start receiving the money you so, so, so deserve. So click the link in the description or go to withsaramack.com and you can download the cash injection ritual from the freebies menu at the top of my page. Please remember to share your celebrations with me when the extra sales and cash starts to roll in. Before we get back to the episode, I have something exciting to tell you about. There were a couple of key things that changed everything in my life as an entrepreneur that allowed me to bring in six figures while working half as many hours and having more fun than ever before in my business. It was money mindset work around how I was doing business combined with getting good at sharing strategic sales content online. I know you know that this is your year to start hitting your 10k month income goal and living the life of creative freedom and fulfillment you have been dreaming about. You're ready to be consistently attracting total dream soulmate clients through the creative content you're sharing on social media and you want to be reaching more people, charging higher rates and working much less. So I'm very excited to invite you to join me in Freedom Club, my mastermind, where you'll receive tailored high-level support to master the skills that will create your dream life and six-figure dream business starting now. With focused weekly trainings and coaching calls to find the clarity on your content that's going to make you the most money, to design a simple, fun launch strategy you'll enjoy following through on, plus daily support and feedback from me in the Voxer chat, you'll find that sweet spot in your business where you're the most confident in your work having the most fun and making the most money. Go to withsaramack.com forward slash freedom club to apply now. Now let's get back to the episode. Okay, let's unpack this because I think it's such an important conversation. So, um, okay, I just did this really amazing um, new moon ceremony with Sarah Jenks. I don't know if you know who she is. I do, I love her. Yeah, and it was on like reclaiming the icon of the whore, you know, at how Mary Magdalene and Christianity is cast as the whore. And basically she highlighted, you know, and I've been reading a little bit about like the lost gospels of Mary Magdalene and how, you know, she was like the equal carrier of Christianity as Jesus, but in the reinterpretation of the teachings by the church and, you know, political powers that be, you know, we've been cast in this mythology where like the only powerful creators are like God and Jesus. And then like the only women are like Mary, who's a mother and nothing else, or Mary Magdalene, who's a whore. So, you know, there's like nothing in the spectrum of like power or like sensuality or all of those things that were embodied by by the women, by the bringers of spirituality and, you know, the teachers of love and compassion. I've been, you know, I've been learning about this recently and so it's very easy to for women to just be cast as like um you're either cast as the mother and just like given an absolutely like unnecessary and unheard of workload because like no one else is taking the burden and you're just like drowning in you know how the culture doesn't support mothers or you're cast as the whore and then it's like all of the shame right the shame like there's no spectrum in the middle in our mythology for like women to be celebrated and revered in our sensuality and our power and our wisdom and be a mother you know and be a lover and be multiple you know rather than just cast in these roles in relation to the men with power so there's that and i think the other conversation which still surprises me that i because i've been a serial monogamist before i met um my husband i did the same thing i was like i'm gonna be single for a year i struggled because again i was just doing like the latching on thing but I was in an open relationship, which I still wasn't like super 
open. I, I traveled a lot, so I was seeing different people in different places. It still felt too much for me to organize like more than one person in one place. But I tried, tried really hard to set that boundary with myself for that reason that I wanted to like see what was out there and not just jump in straight away into another relationship, which I'd been in since I started dating when I was like 15. But so, yeah, so I think there was a lot to be said for the fact that I, I put myself at the center of my world and like, you, you know, instead of pouring a lot of my energy into managing a relationship, poured a lot of energy into managing like my joy and my choices. And, and that really put me in a position to be a match for someone who was going to meet me in that place. And, you know, and I obviously landed an incredible relationship, but my best friend, um, Ali, who lives in Montreal, like she is one of those women who's just proudly, she was proudly single for a really long time. Like she refused to buy in to any of those narratives of like, oh, like you should be worried if you've been, like she was single for many years. Like she'd had, she'd had a couple relationships, but she took pride in the fact that she was really picky. And, you know, and I think that's something to really celebrate. And I know it's difficult because in a lot of communities, particularly if you have like religious background, which I know is like a lot more prominent in the US, you are kind of bombarded with these questions of like, oh, like, are you dating? Like, when are you going to get married? When are you going to have kids? When are you going to blah, blah, blah? And there's all these kind of like timelines and cultural expectations that are put on you that you kind of feel like you have to constantly defend. So I think this narrative of like, let's celebrate women who are choosing to be single over just like falling into the next guy who rolls along when she like the last relationship ends and to really take that time to set her standards and get clear on what she wants and to have a filtering system and yeah be willing to walk away from the people who aren't a fuck yes basically yeah and you know it requires a level of communication and honesty that I don't think most people are prepared for. So a large part of the reason why I'm like, I need this year at least of being single is because like you, I was in a relationship from 15 to almost 20 and then about 20, 21 to 26. So I really never had that time to explore what it meant to prioritize myself, like truly, because everybody knows it's been in a long-term relationship. That person comes in and even if it's the most healthy relationship in the world, they take up shop in your head. I like, and especially if like things are a little bit rocky, you know how hard it is to get things done in your work or prioritize your friends, huge mental real estate. And most of the time it's so fulfilling. And hopefully my goal is somebody moves in and they expand my mind even more. So I have even more space. Hopefully we'll get there. But regardless, it's like a huge thing. You prioritize prioritize them. It's a huge responsibility. It's always questioning, like, am I going to go work on this a little bit later tonight? Or am I going to go, you know, spend time and cuddle? Like it's a whole game. And so of, of prioritizing. And so one, like, I really want to prioritize myself and my girlfriends and my work, my creativity without having to explain it to anyone. And two, like, I'm really not dating to find him. I'm really dating to understand myself more. And what I've experienced is like, I've met these men who have seen me in a certain way, ask questions to a level that I've never experienced, who have like opened my mind, exposed parts of me, like in a partnership that I was like, damn, I never even knew that this, this silliness or this character or this quality could be so important to me. And now that I'm noticing that I haven't had that, that is like absolutely going to be at the top of my list now. And so I think that bringing it back to the communication piece, I see this all the time, like with friends or wherever it's like, yeah, of course you could get, let's say lucky. And like the next person you meet out of a relationship could be, you know, one of the ones for you have a lot of lessons, be a big love. And it's like, well, there's 8 billion people on the world and I'm going to just pick the next one that comes or the second or the third. Like, I really want to give myself the opportunity to really like, know, like feel like, yeah, this is worth me investing my time and prioritizing this person in front of me. And with that, though, the communication piece and the emotional intelligence piece of it is voicing that to people, because that's the scariest part is like saying, like, what are you looking for? And I ask on the first date, I'm like, why are you dating? Like, why are you on apps? Why are you like, what is your purpose here? Are you trying to get married? Are you trying to have a girlfriend? Like, this is what I'm doing. Like, I'm not closed off to being in a monogamous relationship. Like, that's definitely something I'm desiring 
partnering, but right now, like I am dating, <laughs> like I'm newly single. This is what I'm experiencing. And I'm realizing that even now I have to have like even more transparent conversations. Um, and it's really uncomfortable. And I think especially for women voicing this, it is like painful because you know that most people are going to judge you. And it's interesting though, because like men have just been doing that for decades, just been dating without voicing it. And then people get hurt. So it's complicated and I'm definitely not an expert in it, but I'm navigating. Bravely paving the way. <laughs> no, <it's so> <laughs> okay. Yeah, like everything comes down to communication and skill, like relationship, the quality of your relationships rests on the skill and the willingness of both people to communicate better and like with more love and compassion and understanding. And unfortunately, it's a rough world out there and you have to, you have to be the leader in it, you know, especially as women in communication with men. Um, and unfortunately, if they're not willing to listen, like move on to find the ones that are, you know, it's like, that's not something that we want to be wasting our time. Like you can, you can give it as much, <clears throat> as much as you're willing, you feel willing and able, you know, to give, but there are men out there who are willing to communicate. There are men out there who are emotionally intelligent and, you know, there are men out there who are willing to learn and to willing and are willing to listen, you know, men, women, whoever. Um, and that's what, but if you're, you know, if you're putting that in and you're bringing that from your side of the street, then that's what you deserve on the other side of the street. And it's okay to, to keep walking until you find that person or, you know, some of those people. So I love this conversation so much. Um, I would love for you to share, like, um, you know, I know something that inspired you to start the podcast was, yeah, being annoyed by all of these ways that women, we kind of keep ourselves out of our power and like the small ways that we kind of comply with these narratives and these restrictions. Um, so I'd love for you to just tell us a little bit about your perspective on that. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, dating has been one illuminating um, experience. Um, just asking for what we want in general. I mean, I think like even yesterday I um, was getting a pedicure and as soon as like my, the nail polish went on, I was like, I'm going to do like a funky blue color. Like, who am I? And I'm, she puts it on. And the second she put it on, I'm like, oh, this is not me. Like, I'm going to hate these toes for the three weeks they're going to be on. I'm going to be every time I'm going to be like, what the fuck was that? And so like, I had this whole internal dialogue of like, I don't want to be annoying. Like she just put it on. And I'm like, this is the practice of saying, excuse me, I changed my mind. Do you mind changing the color? It's like all of these ways. It's literally just speaking up. It's literally just asking for what you want in every single area of life. Um, and I love dating for the fact that I get to really practice what I preach, like from the first date. Like I was thinking about this. Um, I just started drinking martinis. I'm such a cliche. Moved to New York City, <laughs> start drinking dirty martinis for the first time in my life. And so I was on this date and um, I asked for like a Bombay, like I like a certain type of gin and she brings it. And I know it's not that kind of alcohol because it tastes like gross. And so I just said, like, I had this whole internal dialogue again, of like, I don't want this guy that I'm just meeting to be like this bitch. Like <laughs> she's so picky. She's seriously going to return the drink. And I'm like, this is my opportunity. Like, this is who I am, especially when I'm paying for something or exchanging my energy in some way. Like I want what I want. And so I asked, she switched it and it was the right one. And so it's like all these tiny little ways of just starting to notice I want something and I'm censoring myself because I'm worried about being perceived as a annoying, needy, or too much. Um, and there's just like a million examples. Another one I've been thinking about a lot. I just released a podcast episode on it is apologizing. This was like one of the biggest game changers for me, apologizing for feeling like, I'm so sorry. I'm crying. I don't know why I'm crying. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. I'm in a bad mood. I'm so sorry. I'm so upset. Oh, I was just so angry. I'm so sorry about that. Like, you know, not responding for a few hours or even a few days to an email or to a text message. I'm so sorry. It's a compulsion. People bumping into you and you saying, I'm sorry. Like I do that all the time. And it's something I've really tried to stop apologizing for our looks. Like, that is a big one. Like I really notice it now. Like if, you know, a friend comes up to me and like her hair is in a messy bun or whatever, like, oh, I'm so sorry. I look a mess. 
like all of these things are so corrosive for the way that we perceive women as these, these perfect Mary virgins that need to be perfect all the time. Like we're just being human and we're apologizing for it. Like coming into a zoom meeting, being a minute late, you don't need to apologize. You can say, thank you for your patience, or you can just walk in like a man would walk in like as a human 30 seconds behind. And so these are just all the tiny, tiny ways that really do add up to us constantly feeling like we're doing something wrong when we're not, we're literally just being a human. Yeah. I think I'm thinking as you're speaking, like what is the opposite to, to these things? I know, um, for the, I'm sorry, when you bump into people now, I'm always like, Oh, excuse me. I feel mm-hmm. like that's a good replacement for that. I feel like the, the, the opposite opposing energy is just like, you're welcome energy. You know, like you're welcome. You got to wait for me. You're welcome. You get to see me in my messy bun. Like you're welcome that, you know, I'm choosing to share space with you. And then what that brought up for me is what I've got a lot, even in my relationship is being called arrogant. And I've reflected on that. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not being arrogant often I'm being you know maybe sometimes I am being arrogant and like I'll own that if I am but usually it's because I'm being very assertive with my needs and with my opinions and I think you know as someone who has experienced a lot of misogyny and oppressive behavior um you know like my upbringing and I feel like the UK is is generally worse than um North America it's like my tolerance for it is so freaking low that like I'm kind of beyond caring if I make other people uncomfortable because I'm so beyond taking that on you know it's like after a certain time I'm like I think maybe that's a thing with age maybe it's a thing with just like when you've had particularly abrasive people in your life that kind of like develops earlier but um yeah so I think that's a good one to flag like if somebody calls you arrogant probably what they're just perceiving is like, oh, she's not being sweet and compliant right now. So anything beyond sweet and compliant must be arrogant because I'm feeling uncomfortable. So she must be being rude when actually, so I think it's important to, you know, obviously like, I think it helps to practice like stating your needs, stating how things are going to go down, stating your boundaries and yeah sometimes we do have to do that with emotional intensity and like that's okay like we get to give ourselves permission to be angry we get to allow our like you say our emotions to take up space and to help other people to to become normal to to realize that that isn't a normal experience that we're human beings and we don't have to constantly sanitize our existence for other people's um comfort and i think you know so there's like there's a level of um practice and uncomfortability within ourselves and I think the halfway point is yeah okay so I'm used to being super sweet and compliant and people pleasing and everything that I do and apologizing for my existence so maybe the half step is just like really sweetly (laughs) stating a very hard boundary like there's no wiggle room on this this is my boundary and I'm going to be sweet about it to make that palatable palatable to you but I'm like let it be known that I'm not settling for anything other than this and then I think the level beyond that is like yeah, full self-expression, like obviously having our emotions, obviously not inflicting harm on others. Um, and still, you know, the goal is, um, you know, productive communication, compassionate communication. Um, but I think for me, it's definitely been like learning to name the emotional experience that I'm having and and learning a little bit more about like conflict free communication where you're leading with I so it's not you know blaming it's not lashing out it's not putting responsibility on the other person but just stating your experience from the I perspective like I'm experiencing a lot of like this emotion right now like I feel like what I need you know is this this and this and 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 yeah like practicing and it it is a practice when we've been conditioned in the opposite ways what's your what, what are your words of wisdom around that I mean, I'm with you on everything. I think it's great to give like one step be below, like instead of not apologizing at all for being a couple of minutes late and saying like, thank you for your patience or thank you for your grace, just not over apologizing. So I've like really noticed that with myself is like, 
if I do something that I do think is apology worthy, because sometimes it is like, sometimes you owe somebody an apology. Of course, I'm not saying never apologize again. A genuine I'm sorry is really important. And you don't have to apologize a million times. <laughs> like mm-hmm. you can say, I'm sorry. And that's enough because once you go beyond that initial, I'm sorry, whether it's vocalized or you're just spewing about it in your head, that's when that's when your perception of yourself really starts to change as somebody who always Fs up, who like is just a nuisance, who never has her shit together, who's always a mess. And most women I know myself at times too, like they feel that way. Like, God, I'm just always making these silly mistakes. Well, no, you've just conditioned yourself because society has conditioned you to think that you being human is a huge issue when really it's just being human and trying to exist in a society where we have thousands of messages and DMs and our social circles are way bigger than they ever have been. And we're really not able to keep up with all of it. And that's okay. And so I talked about this story on the podcast, like I was meeting a friend who I really, really respect. She was a new friend. This was like one of the first times we were getting together. It's like solo. And she was just in town for the weekend. And she's like highly successful. I really admire her, really respect her. And um, I've been sleeping with earplugs in because I live in Little Italy and it's really loud at night. And so we were getting together at like 8.30 in the morning. I set my alarm probably for like seven, slept through it, wake up to her calling me. And I am like, oh my God, like I'm so embarrassed. All those shamey feelings, like it's, she's been sitting there for a half an hour. She's like, are you going to come? Like, did you oversleep? I had a feeling I run there. And the whole time I'm like negative talking myself, like, oh my God, like you're a child. How could you do this? Like you've got a business, like what is wrong with you? Like all these negative things. Right. And then about like halfway there as I'm like speed walking, I like calm down. And I'm like, I have a choice. Like I could walk in and I could spend the first 10 minutes of now this only hour that we have together over apologizing, beating myself up to the point that she's probably going to feel bad for me because I'm so distraught. And like, how many times have we done that too? I've done that probably like almost like strategically of like, I'm so apologetic to the point that now you should feel bad for me, which is like, honestly, pretty fucking manipulative. Um, but I know I've done that. I could do that. Um, or, and also I think that's partly to ease your own pain. So like go so deep in it that now you're just like this huge F up and this person's like, oh God, okay, it's fine. It's really not that big of a deal. Or I could walk in calmly, even though I literally have like toothpaste running down my mouth and like didn't brush my hair. And I could say, I'm so sorry. Here's what happened. And just proceed and just be normal and not fill the space with this self-pity, like truly just like patronizing terrible energy. And also like, then when we do that, we get the opportunity to see how people will react And she was so gracious. She was like, yeah, it happens. It happens to everybody. We all have done this. And I'm like, oh my God, this is a gracious woman sitting in front of me. How beautiful is that? Which I never would have even seen that if I was spiraling the whole time. And then also I wouldn't have been present with her. So like, even if you're not ready to just be like, thank you for your grace (laughs) and patience, just like stop over apologizing. One is enough. So I am, I'm with you. I think it's honestly one of the worst habits we have um, as women. And like, there's also a lot of studies that show that we do apologize more compulsively than men, which to me just proves that society is always saying that we are effing up more than men are. And that's just not the case. We are not sorry for existing. We are not sorry for being human. We are not sorry for, sorry for having emotions, Matt. Most of them are put on us from centuries of fucking bullshit that we've been dealing with. So it's about time we stop apologizing for that shit and deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love this conversation. Thank you for coming on. Everybody who wants to continue this conversation, definitely go out and um, check out Sam's She's Too Much podcast. Please tell us, like, what else have you got going on? Where can people find you if they want to keep the conversation going? Yeah. So um, speaking of emotional intelligence, um, I do corporate leadership workshops on emotional intelligence. So if you're um, the rare few that are probably listening to this that are in a nine to five or have teams of your own and you want to start to foster emotional intelligence and intuition and communication practices in your companies, um, you can reach out on that end. 
Um, and then obviously you can listen to the podcast. She's too much. And I'm going to be hosting Reiki retreats in the fall in New York. I do virtual Reiki retreats and certifications. And then of course there is the business schools and boss Academy, but I like just as Sarah does love to make connections. So the best place is always just Instagram DM. If it resonated with you, I want to hear from you. And yeah, I'm just grateful to be here. I'm so grateful for this connection. Like you really just like really do mean a lot to me and inspire me so much. And I'm just happy that Instagram did its magic. Oh, I'm so grateful for you. You're amazing. And I'm kind of sad that I'm leaving New York when you just arrived, but well, well, hopefully we'll definitely hang out in real life in LA and I'll be back to New York. I'm sure. But thank you everybody for listening, for tuning in, please share this with someone who you know would love it. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. For more inspirational content, head over to my website with and please support the show by liking, commenting, and subscribing.